Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Good Morning, Good Night podcast. My name is Matt Demers. I'm here with my buddy, Will Cho. We are two esports professionals that talk about life and random topics that we are currently going through and our ends of the world. I'm in Canada. Will's in Korea. Will, how are you doing this week? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. You know, the week, of course, the week did just start, but uh, it's been pretty good. I mean, this week, uh, so I do like a weekly show with T1. For those who don't know, we talk about LCK, the Korean League of Legends scene. Uh, and our our film shoot for this week was pushed back a day. So it was actually this morning, uh, Korea time, uh, but it went pretty well. So, you know, it's always nice if you like have something to do like early on in the day and it goes well, you know, whether it's like a project or whatever. Um then it kind of gives you energy for the rest of the day. So it's been a pretty good day. How about you, Matt? Pretty good. Um, my day is considerably shorter because I just woke up. But um, the <laughs> isn't it just like such a good feeling when something goes like really right, like a meeting or like a project like that? And then it's like you have this wind at your back for the entire day. It's just great. And that's that's something yeah. that this podcast gives me. This is like I, I mentioned last week where I was like, <laughs> thanks podcast for making me get up uh, on time for like a scheduled thing. But um, this week it's just like, or well in general, it's like I, I'm generally very satisfied when I finish recording the podcast and it kind of gives me a very, you know, much needed boost. Um, this week we actually didn't talk previously about like what we wanted to talk about, but like I've gotten, I've had so much like, good experiences with different things this week where i was just like i played a lot of death stranding played a lot of i dota played (laughs) a lot of that yeah other people have been like man uh or some people have commented about you know just generally the the amount that i'm playing and it's uh it's quite fun i it's exactly what i wanted it to be and that's very weird but i don't know i wanted to start uh, like i came into your stream previously before this podcast and you're playing risk of rain and you're in you're firmly in roguelike country you said so how's that going for you uh it's been good i think you know it's interesting because i actually um i know we didn't talk about it ahead of time but i wanted to ask you about oh yeah of course that stranding and in general of like because you mentioned i think even on twitter right of like i this is what i've been looking for or like recently in games or something similar to that um, and it's funny you mentioned that for roguelikes for me because um, – so I didn't grow up playing a lot of, like, traditional roguelikes, right? Like the turn-based, um, yeah. tile-based roguelikes. Um, I was more introduced to them uh, in, like, the past several years um, with, you know, games like Binding of Isaac, um, Enter the Gungeon, things like that. Uh, so I just – I got back into them recently with a game called Gunfire Reborn. That is a FPS, a first-person shooter rogue like like or roguelite i I don't know what term we're using these days but um it's i think what it's doing for me is you know i play these like long form games on stream right jrpgs and other like uh the last of us 2 is coming up these like heavy games um so when i'm looking for games to play either on my off time or just kind of as like short bits um in the beginning of my stream uh, rather than playing online multiplayer games which can sometimes you know tilt you off the face of the earth uh, it's been nice to play these roguelikes or roguelike likes because it's there's it's always a novel experience um and i think i kind of miss that about gaming and i get like the i'm getting my fill of you know novel like stories and, and fantasy worlds when it comes to jrpgs and things like that um with the bulk of my stream but um for me that the roguelikes are kind of what's hitting the spot it's nice because it's self-contained and it's, that's sometimes what you need where it's like there's almost like a no pressure or expectation that you're going to like win the run if that makes sense and that's something i really liked about isaac where or binding of isaac for shorthand but um i never i i'm like you where i, I never really experienced that t- game type until binding of isaac um i think a coworker showed me it and i was just like oh you feel really powerful when you get these really good synergies going and there's definitely a feeling (laughs) of like just one more run or like you know feeling rewarded for improvising around um challenges that are randomly generated and um i don't know in a weird way when you were saying that like about that kind of self-contained experience it was it was very weird in the sense where i was like oh that's kind of what i like about death stranding right now but for the before we went live we were talking about another roguelike which 
is the one that came with the Dota Battle Pass. And I kind of want to get into that just because right. the, the discussion would be a little bit shorter than what going into Death Stranding, and I just wanted to, like, <laughs> get it out of the way. But I don't right. know. D- Dota's events, like Dota usually for its um, Battle Pass, its TI compendium, like the inter- the the fundraising for the international usually gives a battle pass um or sorry a a secondary mode it's usually an event mode that is temporary um usually it's something player versus environment which means that it's like against ai or dota when they changed their engine to source 2 a couple years ago a big deal about if there was a big deal about okay you can use a map making tool with greater ease and it was almost a little bit similar to um the warcraft 3 engine where it was very friendly to making custom games and making environments and models and whatever so they decided to show that off with a campaign called silt breaker which was actually like a very the closest thing that you could get like a story-based player versus environment like co-op experience for dota and if you're familiar mm-hmm. with games like League of Legends or Dota or whatever, those games aren't very story heavy in the matches you're playing. It's like <laughs> expecting like a story out of like Counter Strike or something like that. And Counter Strike does have <laughs> Counter Strike 1.6 or at least Counter Strike One did have a story mode for yeah. Condition Zero or whatever it was called. But um, that's not the point, you know. Like that's not the point of the game. But Valve has very much learned. The last, the last couple event modes, I don't remember which one Soulbreaker was part of. I think it was two years ago. And then last year or the year before that, I don't remember. They, they pretty much had something that felt like a battle royale where you were opening a room, you were completing it, you were getting stronger. You, the map opened, you had four exits at north, south, east, west, and then you were kind of going to a different room, trying to get stronger, that kind of stuff, meeting up with other teams, killing them, whatever. This year, they seem to have really put a lot more effort into it, where they're not just like using assets that they have, and they're not, they're they actually like hired some guy. Um, I think he was an actor on Mad Men. He's done a lot of other voice acting before, and they basically said, "Hey, you're gonna play this hero or this character that is named in game. Um, the mm-hmm. name it's his name's Agonim, which is from both from Legend of Zelda." as just a like a homage i guess or a reference but um in game he has an item called the scepter and they made an entire it's agonim's agonim scepter and they made an entire event around him and basically saying okay he's this dimensional hopping character he's made a whole bunch (laughs) of rooms that are have different challenges and modifiers and stuff and he also is changing the way that your hero plays so when you pick one of the like six heroes or sorry i think it's like eight heroes that are available the whole cast isn't available um oh okay yeah the whole cast isn't available it's only like eight heroes and you you load in you step on a button everyone steps on a button it's a party of four and the game starts you get a menu that pops up that says okay pick a legendary shard and a shard is something that changes one of your abilities or gives you extra stats or essentially makes you into a very broken PVE character. And every room that you clear, you get different rarities of those shards where it's like, oh, this is a common shard. It might only give you a couple stats or move speed or something. Or if you beat a boss, you get a legendary shard, which gotcha. you know completely changes the way that a skill works or makes it even more busted. Um, so the idea is that you're choosing between two rooms usually every room that you clear and you can get lives you can get gold you can get treasure basically you get to choose how hard or difficult you want to make it and i think after after like 16 rooms you faced off against agonim's our agonim himself and Mm -hmm. yeah it's basically like a roguelike it's basically like binding of isaac it is uh it's very fun and that's the that's the thing is that these event modes you usually do not keep interest very long usually they are fun to play as like a novelty with your friends maybe once or twice just to say that you played them silt breaker like i mentioned earlier was this whole like pv campaign that played very much like diablo and um you played it once and you were just like all right cool that was fun that was something different but what i'm seeing is that people are playing this a lot more and because you have 
persistent upgrades. You have you earn a currency by playing the game that you spend on a skill tree. And that skill tree gives you permanent upgrades so that you're constantly improving. And I think that's one of the the kind of hallmarks of what I like about rogue likes or rogue lights is the other <laughs> nomenclature is that I like games that I don't feel like I've wasted my time playing. And there's two two ways of going about that. There's the the game experience itself is the reward. But then there's the the game experience itself is fun, but you're also grinding some kind of currency that gives you a persistent upgrade that makes runs easier. Um, whether it's like the big one I think of is Rogue Legacy, where it's like a you know oh kinda, yeah 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 it's kind of like a Metroidvania, but then when you die, you keep your gold, you inherit that gold to a new generation of hero that is like your next life. And then before you go back in the castle, you have to spend all your gold. So the idea is that you're raising stats, you're buying improvements, you're improving your equipment, whatever. Sure, you can't hoard the gold through over multiple runs, but you're at least seeing some kind of progress. And with that in mind, it at least makes you feel better when you've like maybe hit a wall in terms of what you can do with your skill. Because if you just keep hitting that wall, you eventually get a enough gold in order to surmount it you know by getting enough passive whatever i guess that's the difference right is that like a game without that kind of like passive um that kind of passive improvement or that kind of like persistent improvement basically says you need to in order to beat this game you just need to be good you know it's like um have you ever played spelunky i've i haven't played through it i i haven't yeah. though i so i've experienced a little bit yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah spelunky is like that kind of game for me where i don't um since you start uh since you start every run the exact same way and you right. are entirely like self-found if that makes sense you find all of the tools that may make or break your run in the dungeon itself and you keep starting from scratch with no like improvement um, that's a game that I don't, I don't find myself drawn to as much. Oh, uh, okay. You know, I, I, I just, yeah, am like, I, I mean, I think yeah. it's, yeah, I think it's interesting. Like for me, so I agree. I am generally more drawn to the ones that have, um, some form of like persistent progression, right. For your, uh, for lack yeah. of a better term, like for your account, right. Or for your profile. Um, but I think for me, it's, um, I think it just scratches the like art like MMORPG itch. Yes. Right. Cause you, you're usually, like you said, it's like some form of like a skill or talent tree. Right. Um, so um, like, I, I like the challenge of games like Spelunky. Um, but those, those games like that, that would be a game where like, I would, I would have to be in a certain mindset. Right. Cause you, the whole point is that you're, you're beating a challenge. Right. Cause you're always starting from scratch. Like you said, um, and you're trying to overcome this, you know, RNG, um, and adapting and seeing how well you adapt every time. Whereas with the progression, it's more about like you can either like like you mentioned, you can either just make it easier for yourself or just make it crazier, right? Whether that's harder or easier, um, not really reliant on that, but just making like more fun or novel experiences. Um, so yeah, I agree. I'm more drawn to that personally. I don't mind the ones that are just you know start back from scratch and uh, it's all about just the point of the challenge. Um, so, for instance, Risk of Rain is technically like that, where you you always start just baseline. Um, there's no, like, persistent upgrade, but you can unlock, like, new characters. And um, as is generally with most rogue lights and roguelikes, uh, you can at least unlock, like, the wealth of items that is available to you the next time you go in, right, by, like, completing challenges. Uh, it's like, oh, now you've unlocked, like, this item to go into the loot pool. Um, so there's something like that, but Risk of Rain is one of those where you're not ever getting other, like, upgrades that apply just to you as, like, a gamer, whereas, like, you mentioned Rogue Legacy or even Gunfire Reborn. Uh, Gunfire Reborn has a very similar system where you get these, like, I forget what they're even called, soul shards or something like that, where, like you said, uh, you end a run and then you have to spend it before you start your next run. Um, but you can, like, get permanent, like, 5% extra damage or, or something yeah. like that for, you know, just your game. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, you know, as we were talking about it, that's what it is for me. It's 
I can I can put it as a I can make it so that it's a challenge, right? Whether it's like a whether I think of it as a time trial or hey, I'm gonna just go for like a certain build even if the RNG is bad or I'm just gonna build whatever like the first item I get or the first skill I get that's what I'm basing my build around right so I can make it a challenge for myself so it scratches the competitive itch a little bit without having to deal with other people like you mentioned Matt it's a self-contained experience Um, if it has these persistent progression models then it scratches that MMORPG or RPG itch uh, and then also, again, it's it's always a new experience because it's based on uh, randomness. It's based on RNG. And so you're always experiencing something new. It's never exactly the same. You know, eventually you get used to certain patterns and certain room layouts or enemy types. But uh, and and. And again, the I, the most important thing as you get older when you're playing games is time, right? Yes. Like if you get lucky and you're having a ridiculous run, then even if it gets longer, you don't feel like your time, like you, it's time well spent. But also if it ends early, it's like, okay, well, you know, I had a quick fix of a game I enjoy and then I can move on doing other things. Yes, definitely. I think that's one of the things that I'm noticing the most. And in, in when I, I still harbor aspirations of streaming for longer periods of time, but a, a large a large amount of my gaming habits these days are just like these like quick like 20 30 minute bursts where it's like i feel like i want to play and then i'll play for a little bit i'll hit this like wall where i'm like ah, i don't feel like playing anymore and it isn't it isn't so much the like <laughs> sitting there for even like two or three hours or like something like that it's always just like 20 30 minutes and i'm like ah, i should probably do other things so or refresh social or something like that and like that's that's the thing is is trying to make that um, personal hierarchy of needs, so to speak. And it's like social media should not, and refreshing social media or checking Reddit and stuff should probably be a lot lower than it actually <laughs> is for me. But, um, with, well, I mean, uh, that was your job before, right? So it's a hard, <laughs> it's a hard habit hard, to break. Yeah. It's a hard habit to break. It's, it's very much, um, especially with the news and being like, a, there's a little bit of a pride with journalists being a news junkie where like, you pride mm-hmm. yourself mm-hmm. on just like um, being connected and being in the know and knowing what's happening in the world or knowing what's happening in your in your niche because if you're able to write about it or able to like make things around it that rewards you with usually money or prestige or um, experience or you know validity in your in your niche kind of thing and it, it's just like it's a very hard habit to break. Um, I wrote a thing about. A manga I really like ending yesterday I published it yesterday and one of the things that I mention is that um, volleyball like the manga is about volleyball and why the series means a lot to me is that I um, it gave me something that I didn't have to ch- uh, that I wasn't tempted to try to turn into like content or money or something because like I know that I'm not going pro at volleyball at 31 you know so it mm-hmm. really gave me something that I could really actually enjoy for what it is. And my self-improvement or my desire to self-improve in volleyball is not from a perspective of, oh, if I get better, I can make content on it. Or, oh, if I get better, I can like play for a real team or something like that. No, it's just purely I'm happy playing pickup volleyball for the city that I play in. And I want to get better so that I can play better at that. And that's a completely different experience from like, oh, I want to get better at roguelikes or I want to get better at Spelunky so that I can like play Spelunky on stream and have people think that I'm good at it or something like that. I know that's a bad example, but I don't know. Going back to Dota, the um, it's really fun. Like there's, there's four different difficulty levels and each room has that choice of do you want to make things potentially difficult and ruin your run or do you want to play the safe ro- or like do you want to choose a more safer room but then you might not be strong enough in order to beat the final boss so it's definitely been right. fun with f- it's definitely been fun with four people and it really hits that feeling of maybe you're playing like a bot game or you're playing like a pve mode like another custom game and you're just your character is like completely broken and is uh, just doing things that you know make you feel like a god essentially um (laughs) like the way that they modify skills and the way that they add things is just like it's it's you can get really really busted builds sometimes and that's always fun i assume it's like just a multiplier of what you would normally see with agative scepter like in a regular dota game 
Is that yeah. the right imagination? Like it's it's that on steroids. So, it, with w- without confusing people who don't know that much about Dota, there's a um, one of the uh-huh. characters. One of the characters that you can play is called Disruptor. Disruptor has three skills essentially, four skills. One puts a puts like a, a lightning ball above a target's head, and it'll strike with lightning every once in a while. One another skill will rewind time uh for that for the target it'll put them back where they were four seconds ago um a third one just creates a ring on the ground of impassable like terrain essentially it's a wall and the last one is a a giant circular storm that silences people inside of it so you can't cast spells so the broken build with disruptor in agonim's labyrinth which is the title of this roguelike is that you get a skill that creates a second wall that's bigger so you have this kind of like two circles (laughs) but then it gets better (laughs) um one of the other kind of broken talents is that everyone inside that wall gets healed for 50 percent of your main attribute every half second so you can get something where you're healing Uh, for like 200 health a second when you're inside the, the ring but that's not all there's also another talent where it's like <laughs> if you're inside that ring, you get 60 attack speed, which is a lot of attack speed in game. Oh wow! So, and then there's another talent where if you cast that storm, it creates another ring. So you can essentially oh wow put down a ring, put down the storm, which creates another set of the rings, and then you have all these like little talents in between that will um, change the duration for how long it lasts or change the setup time because usually the wall doesn't spring up instantly it has to build itself a little bit for like a second or something like that or just reduce your cooldowns entirely so if you get the right combination of talents you are essentially doing an absurd amount of support for the rest of your team and it makes the final boss a lot easier but of course you need to hit those right set of talents that roll because you get three choices after every right right so if you don't get those rolls, you just kind of have to make do with what you, you know, with what you uh, do. But what you get, yeah, yeah, with what you get. But uh, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I mean, I think that's yeah. that's the cool part is that like, like, there's, I mean, I guess when you look at it, right? I mean, certain rogue lights and rogue likes like do have an actual ending, but other ones. You know, it's hard to say you like beat the game or you won, right? It's always just a new experience. But then I think those are the moments where you feel like you've won is when you hit that like dream combo of you know skills or items depending on which game you're playing, um, or or just something that's like crazy, even if it's not the strongest. Uh, like when you were mentioning that, like I think to Gunfire Reborn, which is the one I've been playing more of recently, the FPS roguelite. Uh, where like one of the characters his like his special skill is he can dual wield weapons because you can always carry two weapons and he can dual wield them for like a set amount of time but then if you end up rolling the right like upgrades you can extend your dual wield time for every 20 ammo you spend while in dual wield (laughs) okay and then holding down the button but then you can also have yeah and then you can also have a talent that like returns ammo or as long as you're hitting your shots, like you're not spending ammo. Oh, geez. And so if you get like two machine guns, you're just like infinitely in dual wield mode until you like clear the room and then you're out of enemies. And so there's, there's just these crazy things where that might not be like always the strongest, but it's just, it's just fun. Right. It's just oh, crazy. Totally. Like you said, you, it, it kind of fills that, you know, games, used to be about kind of living out funny, crazy fantasies. And this allows it in a self-contained fun, uh, like environment where it's just you or just you and your friends. Um, and it's like, yeah, th- like this would never be allowed in another game. Like it would never be allowed in a multiplayer game because it's not balanced, but it's like, it's just PVE. It's just against AI. Uh, so it's totally fine. So it's cool to hear, um, hearing you talk about it. Maybe, maybe I should look into the Dodo one as well. I didn't realize that it was that kind of format. I just knew that it had come out because I, I hadn't been really up to date on like the, the battle oh, yeah. pass and everything going around it. Um, so it's it's cool to hear. It's very fun. And like I said, I think I, I don't remember if I mentioned it when we were recording or not, but like I said, you, you, you see these events come out and people play it for the novelty, but I've been seeing a lot of pro players and a lot of like talent um, and streamers playing it regularly, which is always kind of like a little... 
um, it's always kind of a little bit of a stamp of approval when you see people playing it and not giving it up like immediately because um, you know you know that it's actually fun. So another thing that's actually fun uh, we 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 mentioned it earlier, but um, Hideo Kojima's latest opus, let's put it that way, uh, <laughs> Death Stranding. Oh boy, this is a game that that's uh... very divisive. If that makes sense, have you? Yes, played it? that's you what played I was it? gonna say. I, so I haven't played it, but I don't okay. mind if you like if, okay. if spoilers are mentioned because, quite frankly, I don't think I'm ever going to play it, and it's not because I think it's bad. It's just but not your type of I game. Just, I from, from what I've heard. And yeah. and I think it's also one of those games. I've seen a lot of people say, like, well, it's one of those games that you don't know if you'll like it until you play it. And for me, like, we've talked about this a little bit before of, like, both of us have this massive backlog of games. Yes. So yes. for me, I'm like, I don't need to add another game that I, like, I don't know if I'll enjoy until I start it. So um, I'm happy just listening, you know, to people talk about it. So if, if there are spoilers, that's fine by me. Um, but I found it interesting that while the game is so divisive, you seem to like it seems to really hit a sweet spot for you. Yes, I don't love things very like I, I don't like nerd out about things and and be like oh fuck I love this game I don't I don't do that very often. <laughs> um, and for some reason, like watch when Death Stranding came out for PS4, I just like the the funny thing was is that. No one knew what the hell the game was because they they just no. did not do a very good job of or or well on purpose did not do a good job of showing off what the actual gameplay was until like the very last minute. No one knew what you were actually doing in the actual game until it <laughs> until it like came out. People were like, "Okay, well, we have all these kind of confusing story beats. We know we see all these like famous actors that are have like either lended their voice or just their likeness or whatever." Um what the hell is this game though? But it comes out and then I watch a couple people play it and I'm just like, wait, this is my game. This is like the game that was made for me. Really? Not, not necessarily in a story perspective because I don't care about that, but um, <laughs> you've played Breath of the Wild, right? It's You know, it's funny you mentioned that because I've, I've started Breath of the Wild like on or when I first got my Switch, yeah, and I've only played about like two and a half hours, and I could not finish it. Oh, I, I actually plan to finish it sometime this year before Breath of the Wild two comes out. But um, is it like are you, what's similar about it? I'm assuming you're going to compare it to Breath of the Wild. Well, I, the thing is, is that it, for Breath of the Wild, a lot of the interest that I had in it, um, I actually didn't finish it. And I only finished one of the actual main dungeons. The more the the fun that I had from Death, Breath of the huh. Wild was picking a direction or a, um, a a way to go, and then having the terrain and getting there be the challenge of it. And if I was trying mm. to get to this one shrine, or if I was trying to get to a new city, or something like that, it was very fun to kind of have that experience of feeling very rewarded for preparing myself in a certain way um, or just adapting to the challenges that I had, whether it was, okay, I'm going to avoid these enemies or I'm going to fight these enemies or, okay, do I have enough stamina in order to make it up this cliff or something like that, right? And that is Death Stranding. Death Stranding is a game where you play a, a porter. You Basically, it's a post-apocalyptic scenario. Um, you There's no flying and, or like, air travel has been completely eliminated and oh like right now <laughs> yeah exactly but like the world we live in <laughs> yes exactly air travel has been completely eliminated so there's no tr there's no like traveling um by air okay. and there's also um the united states that it is portrayed in death stranding is very weird because there's a lack of scale um you're apparent like it's it's like this rocky wasteland almost and it's very uh so i guess my point that i was trying to make is that there's no like cars you don't have people driving around people are essentially either in right, city, right. grouped in cities or um preppers who are like in bunkers and stuff like that but all those people still need stuff delivered to and from them so the game in the game world is very much reliant on people who actually just put the cargo on their backs and walk 
and go like deliver this cargo and the reason why everything is messed up is basically there are these supernatural beings um i'm not going to go too heavy into it because it doesn't exactly matter that much but what something that's cool mm-hmm. is that <laughs> lore lore wise if you die in the game and your body is not burned within 48 hours these spirits come to you and if they interact with your corpse it essentially creates a giant explosion that like leaves a giant crater and the thing is is that if anyone is killed by that crater it creates a giant chain reaction so this game is essentially uh... yeah so people in cities you ha- part of the missions of this game some of the missions of this game are literally delivering corpses to incinerators because you can't have the incinerators wow. in the cities because burning the bodies creates weird spiritual mumbo jumbo and i don't know it, it, it's it's just basically a convenient <laughs> wow. excuse it's a convenient excuse why a there aren't that many people in the in the game world b they all live very centralized and c the ones that like live on the fringes that are in these little like communes or bunkers or whatever they're very isolated uh, it, it's lore wise and everything like that you can read as much as you want you can get sucked into the world whatever but what hits me the hardest is just the entire game is just delivering things and it's great i love it so much because you get an order and the orders for medals or old wine or hey these are some pictures of um or like encyclopedias <laughs> from the pre the pre-apocalypse kind of thing and it's like what? go bring it to this guy or go bring it to this guy and then there's funny missions where they're like hey i want a pizza you got 30 minutes and you have to arrange your cargo in a way where the pizza box isn't vertical because it'll ruin the pizza so you have to keep that delivery <laughs> box horizontal <laughs> what i know so that's yeah wow. so okay so the thing is is that the game's gameplay is you getting this cargo and you having a weight limit but the weight limit is also influenced by how you arrange your cargo on your back because you're wearing like kind of a mini exoskeleton with a bunch of different like latches and in frames or whatever where you can put different cargo and if you're too le- if you're too weighted to one side when you're walking the game will has a prompt for you to correct your weight. So when you're walking, like imagine you're walking in a uh, game and you're just you're just holding okay. a joystick forward, right? In the game uh, to walk forward. In Death Stranding, while you're walking, you're taking into account the weight of your cargo but also the terrain that you're walking on. So if you are walking at an angle and that angle makes you lean and that lean shifts the weight of your cargo, you got to press left or or right. So you start leaning to the right. And if you don't correct yourself, you're going to fall and your cargo is going to take damage or you might fall in a river. Uh, And then all of a sudden, all your boxes fall off your back. Your cargo is floating down the river and you're like, shit, shit, shit. I got to go get my cargo back. Um (laughs) <laughs> in order to correct that, in order to correct that leaning to the right that can lead you to fall, you just have to hold the left trigger and eventually your dude kind of leans himself back over and you know that's crisis right. averted. But if you're doing that over like a 15 minute walk between cities, it's a very weird very weird kind of experience where if you were just if you didn't have that balance mechanic, you'd literally just be holding forward on a joystick and it would be very boring. But there's this active right, element right, right. of, okay, got to make sure that my weight is balanced. Got to make sure that if I have um, if I have the option of a route between two points, one is very straight but a very rough terrain. The other one is very smooth but it's out of the way. What am I choosing there? Am I choosing to make that risk? Um, you get materials like ladders and climbing spikes and ropes that let you rappel down surfaces or you can use the ladders to climb up cliffs or across rivers or whatever um Mm -hmm. you have a you have a constant like ping that shows you the terrain uh, and how slippery it is or how um hard it is to traverse or if you need to like physically climb over it you have stamina to worry about you have um durability of your boots and stuff like that it's (laughs) it's It's crazy, and that isn't even getting into, like, in order to develop 
the the game worlds you know part of your mission is to connect all these different nodes together of people living like you have essentially right. a ne- you have a necklace that essentially um connects people to the internet if if all these different cities are disconnected <laughs> from the internet you arriving at this pub and putting your necklace into a terminal connects them to the internet and once you've done that you start seeing all the structures that other players have built and it's not like every player who's ever played the game because that would kind of get nuts but it's almost like um you have (laughs) like a a very local shard of of players so to speak and if they've built a bridge if they've built a highway if they've left you a motorbike if they've you know left you a ladder somewhere um you can suddenly see it and interact with it and it creates a very weird communal experience that isn't explicitly multiplayer so if you're the funny thing is the first time you make these journeys you do not see all these things because you haven't connected it onto the internet oh it's so, only once you connect they yeah pop once up. you connect then you see all the stuff that people have built um, ah. so hypothetically like I have I'm at this distribution center I need to go to this wind farm like this power you know farm of mm-hmm. wind power the first time that I go there it is very difficult because I have to go through this slippery ass forest it's raining I have ghosts to deal with I have <laughs> um, you know my durability might be low my, or whatever but I get to that wind farm I connect them to the internet though on the way back at that wind farm, I can access a terminal. That terminal might have deliveries to other hubs that I've already been to. So it's not like I'm never going back to that wind farm, you know? Um, sure. So on the way back, I decide, okay, I, there's a delivery to the hub that I was just at, that I just came from. I'm going to pick up a package. I'm going to go deliver it back to that hub. All of a sudden, like, all those cliffs and stuff that I had trouble getting down or around or, hey, this river that I had trouble getting over, there's a bridge there all of a sudden because someone else built it. You know, there's a huh. there's a ladder at this cliff that I had a hard time getting over. I had to go around it the first time, but now I can just climb a ladder up it. Or if I put a ladder down, I, I can get likes, and it's literally called likes in game. <laughs> I know. I heard about that. <laughs> where you get likes from people, and they're completely useless. Like, you don't spend them or anything like that. But every time I okay. log into the game, it's it, I get a bunch of notifications that said, this person liked the ladder you put down. This person used a road you rebuilt. This person used a bridge that you, or upgraded a bridge that you put down or something like that. And even though you never see these players in game, you never see their Norman Reedus's, um, because the main character is modeled after Norman Reedus, right, right. an actor. You never see them play. Like, you never see them walking around the game world. Or right. Whatever. But you still feel them there. And you still see them like, oh, this person put down a holographic sign that tells me that the terrain ahead is rough or the water head is deep or there are scavengers that want to steal my cargo coming up over that next hill. So it's both a very weird experience where you have to experience things on your own. You get surprised by things, by the terrain or whatever. But then things get easier Things get very easier on the second and third time that you're there because you've got both your own constructs and other people's constructs. Um, The first time you make a large trip between two hubs and then you connect to the internet or you build a road and then all of a sudden the same trip that took you a half an hour the first time takes you like five minutes because you have a road now and you have a motorbike on that road. And you don't have to deal with the rocky terrain (laughs) or the scavengers because the road that you've built goes just above them. It's like a highway overpass. You just don't have to deal with them anymore. It's great. So it's it's probably one of the most unique games I've ever played. And especially in the era of everything being very safe and sequels and known IP and that kind of stuff, it's just so refreshing. And th- these are the type of side quests that I would definitely play to death in other games, but they matter more in this game. They have a greater like narrative weight and that lovely feeling of just being like, I prepared, I, you can, you know, in some games you can set like waypoints and it's just like one waypoint on the ground. You can literally draw like a line 
like a segment of lines over and over and over again, as flexible as you need to, to plan out your route. And then it puts it on your HUD in game. So it puts like an actual line on the actual game world. So you actually feel very rewarded for following your plan and being like, okay, I, I plan this route to get up this mountain. It worked out. Maybe there was some problems along the way, but we made it to the top of this mountain. We made this delivery without any damage to the cargo. They were really happy. I left some ladders that got some likes and stuff like that. I don't know. It's just like, I can easily tell why people really dislike this game because the delivery mechanics and, <laughs> and like the, the mundanity of what you're doing almost like it can turn a lot of people off. I can definitely see that. There's not a lot of combat. There's a couple boss fights, which actually like play very well, but it's just a progression. Okay. It's just a progression system of like, as part of the story, you have to hook up this engineer to the internet. And the first time you do it, you get power a power skeleton. You get a, a set of braces for your legs that essentially double what you can carry. And all of a sudden, that leaning problem that I was talking to you about before, where you're walking right. and you hit like a weird piece of terrain, all of a sudden that doesn't matter anymore. That doesn't happen anymore. All of a sudden you're just like, okay, I can traverse rocky terrain because I have oh. I have metal legs, <laughs> you know? And if you're so... Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you're so overloaded that like you have, say, like a couple hundred kilograms of cargo on your back, sure, you might have to deal with it, but it makes the experience so much easier where you're not... Like you feel like a very linear... Or not linear, but you, you feel a very constant rate of improval things get easier the longer that you're doing it in these games where you're like, okay, I've been through this train before. I know where this ladder is. I have to get up to this top of the mountain where there's no roads, so I can't take my motorbike, but I know this route already. It's easier this time. I know that I can go and skirt this forest in order to avoid ghosts. You know, And I know it sounds really weird, but it's... um. <laughs> I think Let's be honest. Every, everything you've said about the game sounds is very weird. weird if you oh, oh, just dude, listen I, to it without. <laughs> yeah, you fight the ghosts. You fight the ghosts because Norman Reedus in this game is a very special person. Um, when he gets taken by the ghosts, he doesn't die. He can come back, and because of that, his bodily fluids um, are ways of fighting the ghosts. So you get grenades that literally right, spray a cloud right. of your blood, and that kills ghosts. And when you use the in-game washroom, sitting or standing, it will refill grenades in your inventory that use literally your pee and your poop, and you throw those at ghosts, <laughs> and that defeats ghosts. Gosh. So, <laughs> it's if you've ever played That's the metal, something. If, you, if you've ever played the Metal Gear games, you know that Hideo Kojima loves his weird ass like plot points and humor and things like that, but. This is just him unleashed a little bit. And from a story perspective, you're just like, okay. I don't... You, you have to be comfortable that you're not going to get all the answers to the in-game story. And you're going to see people like Guillermo del Toro pop up as a major character. And it's not his voice. That's the weird thing is that it's his likeness as a character. But they couldn't get him to do all the voice acting. So they have another mm -hmm. guy just putting a different voice in his mouth. And that's a very jarring experience. But you have like, hey, one of the people that's a prepper, it's Conan O'Brien. Right, I'm right. Making, I'm making a shrug motion that audio can't hear but, or see. But Conan O'Brien is in this game because he used his likeness for um, one of the preppers. He didn't put his voice in the game, but you just, you're just you delivering pizzas to Conan O'Brien. That's just how it is. His name isn't Conan O'Brien in-game, but whatever. So you kind of just get the feeling where you're like, okay, Hideo Kojima has a bunch of famous friends that he wanted to put in his game and that's how he did it and you're just like all right whatever sorry to, to to like i could gush about this game because it's just like such a unique experience but it also hits that weird thing where like i said when i play games i tend to want to have as um i go into them saying i want to experience as much of them as possible so you could rush through this game and you could just do all the main story deliveries but and then you'll fight the bosses and advance the plot and go to these new locations whatever but there is this like very relaxing thing where i don't feel rushed to do that there's no like real stakes in the plot there's no like ticking time bomb yet where i am 
So I just log on and I'm like, okay, let's just do some of these random deliveries and maybe I'll get more lore that unlocks in my codex or maybe I'll get a conversation with this person or maybe this person that I delivered to that doesn't trust me right away warms up to me and I get more of their plot line. And yeah, it's delivering pizzas, but you know, you get little rewards like that. I, I'm not playing it for the I plot. guess I'm just... It's it's weird. Yeah, Sorry. I mean, I guess I'm just trying to, like, without, you know, obviously I haven't played it. No, um, it's fine. So from what you've said, here here's what I've pieced together yes, sorry. from what okay. you said. So bring me back on the, track. Will. <laughs> so the game has its its own challenges in terms of like for for the player, not not as in the game has challenges, but the the game challenges yeah. you in its own ways. And it sounds to me um, like for for people who know games that are called Souls likes, so they're typically modeled after or named after you know Dark Souls, which is a a game franchise that. Uh, prides itself on you know just the sheer difficulty right where you get hit hard by like all the enemies uh they all have like certain patterns you need to learn but it's not unfair those games right it's it's not not unfair unfair, right it's fair it's it's all about learning the combat like system and, and the patterns so that game focuses on combat whereas like i guess this game is it's like orienteering but in a video game is that like a good way to think about it Yes. And so like, you know, when okay. you're in school and, and you're, you're learning about narratives and you're learning about conflict and it's like, you're, you're learning about man versus nature, man versus man, man versus God or man versus concepts or whatever. Um, you know, for a book where you're saying, okay, well, what's the, what's the central right, conflict right. in this book is, is man struggling against the environment? Is he struggling against, you know, a, a, um, an antagonist that's okay. It's man versus man, or is he struggling against, you know, his own inner nature or whatever? This is firmly a man versus environment game. And yes, there are combat sections. And yes, there's this terrorist leader who's the main antagonist of the game. But you're not shooting dudes, you know? Like, eventually you can get a assault rifle that can kill someone. But you don't want to kill anyone in this game. Because then the ghosts come and blow up the landscape. <laughs> right. That's it's, not the main point. It's that's just, not the it's main just point. You have that option. but You have that that's option, not... yes. So if you... Okay. You can play this game without well, k- killing a person. You can you can play this game completely stealth. But sorry, continue. You had a thing. Well, actually, I was <laughs> I was listening to you. I was like, do you think a lot of people these days know what orienteering is? No, <laughs> that just, was the funny I just, thing. I was in that scouts. just dawned on me. <laughs> I was I was in scouts, so I knew it, but I hadn't heard that word in that <laughs> like um I hadn't, <laughs> in that context for like forever. So like orienteering so for yeah yeah for you explain it for know. viewers or listeners who may not know yeah sorry I was in Boy Scouts so I knew I knew what orienteering is um, but like I said I have not heard that word in that context forever um, okay so orienteering is basically like you have a compass and a map and you're basically for for how I learned it anyway it was just like imagine imagine for scouts imagine you're part of the Boy Scouts and for an activity they just like put you in a park. And they say, okay, you got to get to this, to this like rest station. All you have is a compass and a map. Go, you know, and yeah, just figure it out. Yeah. It's figure it out. And it's also not so much in like a, oh, they want you to be like a harsh survival person or whatever. It's more about viewing the landscape as a challenge and being like, what's the most efficient or safe way using this compass and this map in order to get to this way station or this rest station or whatever and the map that you'll have typically has the topography so you'll know how steep inclines are or if it's a hill or you know rough terrain or whatever and the idea of orienteering is that you're orienting yourself to the most like uh efficient way i guess of traversing this terrain so yes i would say that is a, a major major part of this game okay okay i that actually as someone who enjoyed, I wasn't in like Boy Scouts, but I um I've done a lot of orienteering just because of like the camps I went to. I always had that as like an option for activities and stuff. So as someone who enjoyed that, that actually that actually sells it a bit more for me as someone who had zero interest in playing it. I was very interested in the game itself, but not not in playing it. But okay, so that's like the main. It's an easy way to look at the main, I guess like challenge that you will have as a player but i'm here's a different question and this this may be maybe this is like offensive to (laughs) to death stranding um but 
like have you played the those like euro truck simulators it is it's very similar it's a very similar relaxing okay. experience i played euro truck simulator before did you enjoy that game as well i have yeah. not i haven't I played did, it i did i played I, I didn't i'm not one of those people that like those games have endless dlc and like i'm not one of those right. people yeah, yeah, yeah. where i'm like oh i want to every every new map that or country that comes out i want to like instantly play it like i'm not one of those train simulator people <laughs> those train simulator people are crazy those that dlc is like twenty thousand dollars to complete it it's crazy um yeah if you ever want a good sticker shock go to steam go to train simulator and add all dlc and it's something like twenty thousand dollars it's it's silly really yes um because there's just so much of it because it um anyways it's kind of like that but it's like Imagine Euro Truck Simulator, only it's science fiction, but, like, not too hard science fiction. Maybe it's, like, 50 years in the future. And then there's more emphasis on logistics rather than driving, if that makes sense. Like, imagine if Euro Truck Simulator had, like, dirt sure. dirt roads instead of, like, highways. Like, I, I don't know. I find this is almost like a more hardcore Euro Truck Simulator. Because with Euro Truck Simulator, you've got gotcha. smooth road, you've got smooth roads, you've got highways, whatever. You have to still pay attention to traffic, like you can't run red lights. You get pe- penalized for that. You, you know, you want to speed limits on highways and whatever. You want to make sure your cargo isn't damaged. You still have to deal with backing up into a, um, like some of the lots in Euro Truck Simulator. You have to back this eighteen wheeler into this lot. And it's really difficult oh. because the way that it's, you know, the neighborhood is, you can't go <laughs> off road. You know, you have to just be, you have to be very patient and very careful with it because there's other cars on the road. Death Stranding, you can take those concepts and port them just to being a, a person. Like, you are backpacking with a lot of this cargo, but you do get a motorcycle. You do get a truck. You do get other things. And the idea is that you have to develop the logistics around them to make using those tools viable so you can use a gotcha i see what you're saying yeah. you can use a motorbike off-road in this game but if you go through water your battery drains really quick if you you know you might get stuck i, I posted a screenshot on my twitter the other day where i was like i thought i could take this truck off-road down this mountain and now i am not <laughs> it's stuck in a river and i can't get it out i saw that it, it's literally 45 <laughs> degrees in a river and I can't get it out. And there is an option in the game to disassemble that truck and remove it from the game world. But I'm just leaving it there because I'm just like, all right, this is a monument to my hubris. I can't let this game, I can't let myself (laughs) think that I can beat this game by just brute forcing a truck down, you know, a mountain essentially. And I left it there. And I also left a couple signs that said, do not use and also a sad face. So when other people come across that truck, oh. they're going to be like, yeah, that person messed up. <laughs> Don't be that person. Oh. So other people that's can cool. see my mistake. And and again, that's another thing that is really, I love those kind of collaborative experiences. It's not quite competitive and it's not quite cooperative, but it's collaborative. You can see other people's, it doesn't make the game too easy, which I think is a thing. I was very scared of coming into this game late. Where, oh, I'd come in and, and all of a sudden there'd just be roads built. And yes, they do degrade over time in game. The major gimmick of the game is that all rain in the game speeds up time for things that it hits. So it's deadly right, to humans, right. obviously. And it also degrades all your equipment and it degrades the things that you've built and stuff like that. So it's not permanent. Like if you build the roads, they're not permanent in game. And it's also they're pre they're mm-hmm. pre routed. You can't just like build a custom road. When you right, give materials right. to a road, it just builds a very set route. Um. So yeah, I don't know. It's it's like I said, it's more focused on the logistics, and it, I almost want to say it's more of a business simulator. But it's not like you're getting money that you use to. Um, it's not like you're using money to improve your business. What you're building the currency is goodwill instead of money so when you deliver like every every contact that you deliver things to is on a star system you've got one to five stars and like i said about that guy that gave me the powered armor Ah. 
when I made more optional deliveries, all of a sudden I got the level two and level three powered armor. Like the, the skeleton gotcha. that lets me like be more stable and carry more stuff. So if I just moved on with the story and didn't develop that relationship, I wouldn't have got those things. So there are little like in-game things that you get for furthering these relationships. So from a story perspective or a narrative perspective, it's one of those things that when you read or when you like hear the dialogue and they talk about the we're reconnecting America, you're like, <laughs> all right, all right, Kojima, I get what you're saying and I get what you're trying to go across, but it's coming across a little too cartoony or a little too like forced melodrama. Um, it's like sure. with Metal Gear. It's like with Metal Gear Solid. Like you played Metal Gear Solid, and when Sniper Wolf mm-hmm. is dying and she's talking about, oh, can love bloom on a battlefield? You're right, like, all right. right. <laughs> One part of me is like, yeah, that's kind of awesome, but the other part of me is like, okay, that kind of sounds a little silly, you know? Or like even playing like Psycho Mantis, the character that reads your memory card, and if you've other if you've played other Konami games, he comments that you've played Castlevania, and you're like. All right, right I, I get what you're trying to do there. I get I get what you're doing. Like, this game has... You get a little, like, um, you know a wagon that you pull behind you? You get a mm-hmm. hovering version of that in order to, like, put your cargo on, and you can just pull that it behind you. That sounds pretty awesome. You can skateboard on that thing. <laughs> you can, <laughs> that you sounds can, pretty awesome. You can ride on that hover thing down a mountain if you want. <laughs> and it's like... It's kind of like Breath... Like, if you had played more of Breath of the Wild, you would kind of understand where I'm coming from with this, where, like, Breath of the Wild, once you make it up a mountain peak and you've prepared for that trip by making warm clothes or you have a potion that gives you cold resistance or whatever, because otherwise you're going to die from the, the, the temperature up there, you can use your shield in order to snowboard down a mountain in Breath right. of the Wild. And it's, like, it's kind of the same thing here, where you can mess around... And you can build things that make other people's lives easier or your lives easier. Like, I haven't got to this point yet, but eventually you get zip lines. You can set up these posts mm-hmm. that link together. And it's almost like a, a hovering zip line. And all of a sudden, because like I watched other people play this and I kind of listened to another podcast where they were discussing week after week where they were in the game and what they'd unlocked. They were like, wow, this kind this is awesome because I'm traversing mountains with this zip line that took me like an hour to get a, get over before but there was also this feeling of man that sucks i wasted an hour getting over that mountain before and now it just takes me like two minutes by <laughs> zip line what the hell so my point is for people listening to this i'm not necessarily just yelling at you to play the game it's more of that i am saying that everyone makes a big stink over games as art And they make a a big stink over, oh, we want games to be taken seriously as their own art form. But in a way, the games that are usually the loudest about that are the games that are really safe and samey because they'd want to be like movies. Like, I have no interest in The Last of Us 2 because partially because of how loudly they were like, this is gaming Citizen Kane moment. And it's like... I have played games like The Last of Us Two. When you the say Last of Us. when you say they are loud, do you mean game the critics, the of press, the game? or the, the, the game critics? Yeah, okay, the it's, ones it's, around it. Okay, yeah, the ones yeah. around it, and to a certain degree, the, the the game creators themselves. It's like from what I uh, this is we're running low on time, but I don't want to turn this into an in depth discussion of The Last of Us Two. But well, from I'm, what I'm I'm going to be playing it soon, so yes, we can talk from, about it afterwards. From what I've heard from a lot of people it's misery porn where it's like we want you to make you feel sad and because we're making you feel sad that means that we're a deep game and it's like all right i've seen god of war i've seen uncharted i've seen other games from sony where it's a a, a movie simulator so to speak and yeah it has gameplay but it has those long cut scenes and it wants to be a movie i'm more just saying that weird ass games like this that aren't for everyone and aren't afraid to be not for everyone, those are closer to games as art than games like The Last of Us will be. Because The Last Let's... of Us... That's a pin for another conversation. That's that's another Well, no, I want to talk about it after yeah. I play because yeah. I 
I'm going to provide a counterpoint and we can pick it up from there when we get to that topic yes. after okay. I played The Last of Us 2. My counterpoint would be that I don't think that the wackier ones are closer. I just think the wackier is one don't get as much credit because not as many people like That's what I'm more saying. Are I exposed think... to them. I would agree. Yeah, cuz I would I don't think I don't think it's fair to take away from the games that you know go a certain route just cuz it's been explored before. But I think I, I think I'm more But I do saying, I would agree that the wackier ones are not like recognized as much. There's wacky when they should be. There's wacky in terms of oh that's strange it's like Katamari Damacy, you know, where it's still okay, pretty well, accessible. Okay, well okay, yeah. All right, let's and clarify it, that. And, okay. And every, everyone is still like, "Oh, okay, I can see the appeal of the game." Someone asked me, "Oh, is this game legit good? It looks like a skip to me on Twitter." And I was able to say, "Okay, you like The Witcher 3. Imagine if The Witcher 3 had no overarching plots and and it was just about fulfilling Witcher contracts." Where you go to a, a town, you learn about this monster, you kill the monster, that's it. And you do that 300 times. And each time you get little bits of lore and you learn stuff and you do it in different locales and whatever. Imagine if that was The Witcher 3. And then other responses were like, it's a FedEx simulator. And you're like, I think that does that very, that, that does the game a disservice, you know? Because it's hard to parse and because it's hard to... Um, because it's hard to explain why it's good, it shouldn't be written off as just that weird game. You know, it's like art house cinema versus something that wins best picture at the Oscars. I'm more inclined to believe that that art house cinema that is very difficult for everyone to enjoy, um, and takes work and takes mental like readiness and research in order to like apply why you should enjoy it or why it is enjoyable or why it's useful to the medium i think those are infinitely more interesting in advancing the discussion of is this art you know and it's the same thing with this because it's so complicated and because it's so divisive and because it's such a unique experience i'm more inclined to say that it advances the discussion of our game's art a lot better than Last of Us. And I think that's the differentiation of the topic. And we'll get there after you finish Last of Us 2. But Yeah, I'm yeah, I'm still a bit on the other side cuz Yeah. I it, it gets it gets longer, but I I think as much as so I think one thing we can both agree on is the the ones that push the limit, so to speak, definitely don't get as as much recognition as they should. That much I think we can both agree on. Um, but I also do think making it digestible to as many people as possible, not always like everyone, cause that's, you know, impossible or you have to dilute it too much, but as many people as possible is like part of the responsibility of a creator. Right. I th- and think so that, I think that's the key. The, like, like, I think that's the crux of the yeah, argument. But you're, so you're running a risk reward. Right. And, yeah. and I agree that you can't just like, you shouldn't just call something trash just cause you didn't get it. But there could be an argument made of okay, so it ha- perhaps had good merits, and and that's when, that's when the people who perhaps have more experience or background, or you know whether it's actual studies or whether it's just experience with those types of medium, um, can chime in. Uh, but I think you know for the general masses, it, it's kind of also unfair to expect everyone to put in that time, right? Because we 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 all have limited time. Oh, totally. Um, the yeah, just that... yeah, just to frame it in a short aspect, like it takes me back to I played Killer Seven not long ago, yeah, um, which is also you know a, a very weird game so to speak, um, and I I didn't you know it wasn't my game like I would not have played it if it wasn't a bit goal nominated on my stream I would never have played it I don't think I don't think I would have enjoyed it if I played it off stream at all, but like the whole time I was playing I was like I can I can see why the people who do like it like it so much and like rank it so highly. Um, and I could, you know, I could name like certain aspects. And then at the end, if I were to give my opinion about it, I would say I didn't like it. Right. But did I, do I think it, you know, do I see why people think it's a good game? Like, yes. Um, so, but then again, I, like, I don't expect other, you know, like I, I deal with games for a living. So like, I don't mind putting in that time to explore that, but, um, you know, not everyone can. So I, I'm, I'm always kind of on that kind of middle road when it comes to what's the creator's responsibility no totally um the 
what that little like discussion that we attempted to have in 10 minutes is probably something that's been happening for centuries in terms of de debating the merit of art, <laughs> you know, and I, I think that there's more to be talked about with video games because of how um, how tied it, it tied in it is to commercialism and like the sales of a game is tied into how it's developed. And that's another conversation, but I don't know. I'm more just saying is that if you're looking for something a little weird and a little different, but something that like I could tell as we were talking about it, you were warming up to it a little bit, you know, a little bit here and there. And it's kind of just like watch some streams of it because you will likely never play another game like it. And there will likely never be another game developed that is Death Stranding 2 or Death Stranding Plus where like some other developers like I really like the concept of that Death Stranding game. I'm going to make another game in this genre. I don't think that's ever going to happen. So right. if you're that I think that's what interests me the most about it is that there are those games like Journey. Journey is a great one. There's not, not another game like Journey where it's like asynchronous and like kind of co-op but kind of not. So when you have that list of games that you need to if, if you want a well-rounded gaming taste or if you just want to figure out what your taste is you have these games that are irreplaceable and i think death stranding is on that list because of just how unique it is and how it makes you feel and yeah i don't know well where can people find you on the internet you can find me um, streaming uh, five to six days a week on Twitch uh, and also on Twitter, both under the name of Will Chobra, W-I-L-L-C-H-O-B-R-A. Um, those are the platforms I'm most active on. I also have a Discord server, which you can find through both of those platforms, um, where it's just a place for if you are um, if you want to get more involved with the community we have going, mostly based around my stream uh, and other content I work on. Uh, that's the place to be. Uh, and these days, my stream, uh, we are still working through the Kingdom Hearts series, um, currently on Birth by Sleep. But afterwards, nice. like we just mentioned, I actually am going to finally get around to uh, checking out The Last of Us 2. Um, so if you've maybe played the game or if you haven't yet and you want to see what all the hullabaloo is about, uh, we will find out together in a couple days. Nice. That's awesome. You can find me on the internet, mattd.cc. Um I've been doing a lot of writing lately, which is something that I'm always happy about. Um, I wrote about a manga and anime I really like called Beck. And then yesterday I also read or wrote about um, the ending of Haikyuu, which is a manga mm -hmm. and anime about volleyball, which is near and dear to my heart. So mattdemers.com is where you can find both of those um, both of those blog posts. I'm going to be probably writing something about Death Stranding today or tomorrow. Um, mostly just because I need to get thoughts out while it's fresh. Um, but yeah, that's the content that I've been creating lately. Um, otherwise, you can check out my Twitch stream, Matt Demers. Everything's on mattd.cc is where you can find just all my links and stuff like that. Uh, you can check out gmncast.com for all of our previous episodes, reddit.com slash r slash gmncast. Um, we have episode threads for every episode we do. So leave us some comments, feedback, that kind of stuff. There's also links for the kind of like non-standard podcast stores where you can find our um, episodes. But if you are, want to subscribe, you can check out iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts. We're all on there as well. Will, I hope you have a good night, my friend. And I hope you have a good morning, Matt. Thank you, sir. We will see you guys next week.